Have you ever been overwhelmed when you are shopping for homeschool curriculum? Stick around. That's what I'm talking about today. You know, there's never been more resources than what we have now in the homeschooling world that are available to us. I mean, we have online, we have uh, online curriculum, we have online groups where we can meet people and ask them questions. But sometimes when we have those resources, it just leads us down a path that leads to harder decision making because there's so many choices and so many options. So today I'm talking about some things that will help you when you are choosing curriculum, how to feel better about the decisions you've already made, how to go ahead and be proactive and make a decision and stick with it. Number one, there is no perfect curriculum, so be prepared to make adjustments. Okay, so what do I mean by adjustments? Adjustments can be how you present the material. Maybe the original plan is to do one new lesson every single day, but maybe you need to take a lesson and spread it over a two to three day period. Maybe the original plan is to do all of the problems on a page, but maybe you only need to focus on a few. So look into the curriculum you're using and ask yourself, are there ways that you can make adjustments? Another way that I've made an adjustment is to supplement the material. My children work through Singapore math in their younger years, and then they switch over to Saxon. And there are good things to say about both of those, but I have supplemented both of those. It's kind of nice sometimes for a child when you give them something different. Maybe it's a puzzle page that deals with some math. Maybe it's something you've printed off online. Maybe it's even a certain app or something like that. Every curriculum has its weaknesses. So if you can supplement, expose your child to some other ways of presenting the information and be flexible, that's one of the things that we have in homeschooling that so many other parents don't have. They don't get to choose the curriculum. They don't get to choose time and make adjustments there to say, oh, you know what? We're going to pause and not move on to the next lesson. I'm going to look for some more practice for you to do this before we move on. Remember that in homeschooling, you, the parent, are the teacher. And so you can make adjustments. You can say, you know what? I don't think we're going to do this lesson. We're going to skip this. You know what? I think we're going to modify this lesson and only do part of it or stretch it over a certain um, certain amount of time. Don't let the curriculum rule you. When you do that, you train your child to say, oh, no, you can't do that, mom, because, you know, it says to do this. No, you are the teacher and you have lived life as an adult. And that's what you're preparing them for in homeschool anyway. Number two, you can pick and choose a different curriculum for each subject. By that, I mean a certain brand of curriculum. Some people just shoot for convenience. Maybe their child is uh, performing at a good enough level. Maybe they just are motivated enough on their own that for convenience, a parent may choose to order a box curriculum. And what that is, is like if your child is in third grade, you may order from a certain company and it just comes all their traditional subjects for third grade in that box. And that can be exciting and that can be convenient as far as saving you time on searching and shopping. But with homeschool, you have the ability to pick and choose. And so you, your child may need a certain, uh, company, a certain brand of math that works for them more. Maybe they need an extra challenge, something more rigorous. Maybe they need something that goes at a slower pace and gives more practice work, but they may need something entirely different for reading. And there are companies that focus only on math, so they're not going to have a matching reading curriculum. And that's kind of what we do in our family. We just pick and choose uh, different ones. And where I go a lot is YouTube for reviews so that I can see the inside of books and see what people are saying about different curriculum. Hey, parents, make sure you check out the description below. I've got some helpful links and resources that I'm sure that you will love. Number three kind of ties in, and that is look at online curriculum reviews. Most of us as homeschool parents don't get to go to some of the big homeschool meetups and conferences. If you do, leave a comment below and tell me what that's like for you. I'm sure that they have vendors there who are selling different curriculum and you can actually thumb through that. I look at online reviews, like I said before, in 
on YouTube. I can ask some of my friends what they are using and even ask to borrow uh, a certain book over a weekend and kind of look through it and see if it would be a good fit for my family. Number four, the curriculum might not fit the state standards perfectly. Now, I taught school for 12 years, and I've been homeschooling for almost that long as well. And so I can tell you that curriculum companies will say that they match a certain standard or whatever, and they don't necessarily do that. And maybe that's not something that you're concerned about. A lot of homeschool parents aren't. However, if you are a new homeschool parent and you are wondering, am I going to stick with this or am I going to put my kid back in school, then you may be wanting to find something that kind of matches your state standards. Well, just know that the standards aren't the end all. The standards are different than what they were when we were growing up and we learned just fine, right? So it's more important that you choose your curriculum, stick with it, and feel free to step outside the curriculum as well. If there's something that you encounter in your daily life that your child doesn't know how to do, make time for that and stop and teach your child how to do that. So a good example might be in the area of cooking and fractions. If you find that your child uh, struggles a little bit in that, maybe that's a clue to you that you need to stop and like do some fraction work and do some fundamental things, learning and naming fractions. Number five is to point out that there is a difference between a spiral curriculum and a mastery curriculum. So I'm mainly thinking about the area of math here when I say this. A good example of a spiral curriculum might be Saxon math. So they teach a new skill. They give mm, anywhere from five to ten uh example problems that match that new skill. And then the primary problem set for your child is bunch of mixed review of things they've already covered with a few of the new skills peppered in. So that is a spiral review um, curriculum where it's constantly reminding the child of things that they have already learned. And that can get monotonous for some children who learn very quickly, commit it to memory, and they don't have any regression. The other kind of curriculum is a mastery curriculum, and that is going to stay on one particular skill or lesson until your child really gets it, and then you move on. But just think of that, have that in the back of your mind. A lot of us were not taught with a spiral curriculum. So for example, a traditional math book when you were growing up and when I was growing up might have a whole unit on fractions and you would just do a bunch of fraction stuff. And then you would have your maybe chapter test throughout that fraction unit. And then at the end, you would have a big unit test. And then you might move on to another unit like geometry and you would do a bunch of things with shapes and you might not do any more fractions. <laughs> and so it was kind of easy to forget. Oh, I haven't seen this in a while. So again, uh, Saxon is a good example of the spiral curriculum if you're wondering uh, what one of those might look like. Number six, you don't have to buy a curriculum for every subject. Now, when I say that, I mean, in order for your child to learn, you do not have to buy a curriculum for every subject. Obviously, we all live in different states here, so I can't promise what your state requirements are for homeschool. But I can tell you with my children at the elementary level, I didn't always purchase a separate science or social studies curriculum for them. The primary thing that they were learning about science and social studies were certain concepts, ideas, and vocabulary in different science and social studies areas. So if I needed ideas, I could look at the um, science or social studies st standards for my state. Doesn't mean I adhered to them perfectly, but I just needed some ideas. And that gave me some ideas on what I could have my children write about, draw about, read about, what kinds of library books that I could check out, all of that. Um, and we our children learn really, really well with that. Um, we worked in documentaries and things like that too. So you don't necessarily have to buy a curriculum for every single subject, but do check your state requirements. There are a lot of um, groups of homeschool parents online that buy and sell used curriculum um, a lot on the social media websites. Of course, you have your normal things like eBay and um some thrift book stores online and things like that. I've even gotten some curriculum for free just because some parents are just really busy. They've got a lot of kids. They've saved up a lot of books and they need to get rid of them. So anytime I get something for free, I look at it, I hang on to it a while and decide, is there a place where I can use this 
usually there is. But if I've hung on to it long enough and I can't use it, I just pass it on and bless someone else with it. Number seven, you may finish the curriculum early or continue the curriculum into the next school year. So just like I said in another video, my child, my second grade child, uh, didn't finish all of his second grade math. Part of that was my fault. I was busy with some business things and we just weren't very diligent with it. So we used our summer to finish that. That doesn't mean he was working eight hours a day. I know some people that don't really understand homeschooling uh, really misunderstood that when he would say, yeah, I still have to do some work this summer. But we made sure to go ahead and finish that. I paid for that. Those are some skills. You don't have to throw something away just because it's a second grade math book or whatever, and your child is in the next grade level. Go ahead and finish it through because a lot of math books anyway will have some review. Or if you know for sure you're not going to use it, pass it on, give it to someone else. I can't tell you how many times that someone has passed on a free textbook or curriculum to me and I looked through it and any unused pages, I just tore out, stapled some of them together. And we used that um, whenever we had a day where we were on the go and I didn't want to pack a full book and I wanted my child to still have some review and something to practice on. So just remember that you have that flexibility. You don't have to just move on to the next thing. Another area where I've seen homeschool parents um, do things a bit differently is if their child finishes a certain book, they move them immediately onto the next grade level, immediately to the next grade level, next grade level, thinking they are getting their child ahead. Not necessarily so, because remember, there is no perfect curriculum. There are so many other things you can do to supplement. So what I normally do, if my child finishes their math book, let's say, early um, for a school year, I don't immediately go to the next grade level. I wait for the next school year before I start that next grade level. And I may purchase like an extra uh, word problem book, or I may get them an online math subscription to something else. I just try to see how can I make the learning go a little bit deeper rather than just moving on to the next level of that same curriculum. It's good to expose them to some other ideas as well. Number eight, expect to change curriculum at some point. So you may be spending so much time researching and you're struggling making a decision and you just need to go ahead and choose something because you're probably going to switch later on anyway. Now, that doesn't mean that you should switch every single year. I've heard recently from some parents who may regret that they did that, particularly in the area of math where they may have missed out on a skill here and there because each curriculum has their own weaknesses. But it is okay if something is not working for you and you need to change. Again, that's the beauty of homeschooling. We have that freedom where we need to do that. Just go ahead and expect that. You may be purchasing from a certain curriculum that you afford now, but maybe you can't afford it later in years to come. Or you may start with something that has an excellent program at the elementary level, but by the time your child starts middle school, maybe they either don't offer a middle school level or maybe you don't like their middle school products as much. That's an opportunity where you can just stop what you're doing, sell it to someone else who may be interested, give it away and choose something else. Just go ahead and expect that change and embrace it. Number nine, meet with experienced homeschool parents who can share advice. This is so valuable, especially the closer that the closer our kids get to the high school age, for example. So whatever career path they're going to take or college path they're going to take, it can be helpful to know what you are doing before your child even starts ninth grade. I recently heard a parent online say that she researched what was required of the college that her child was interested in, uh, what was required before her child even started ninth grade so she could kind of lay out a plan for high school. It can also be helpful to talk to other homeschool parents who've been doing this a while to learn like, well, what's the most important thing? Or um, what's something that I don't need to worry about so much? And everybody will have their own opinions, but the more people you talk to, the more you're going to see that there are just certain truths, certain patterns of what the people are saying that you're like, okay, well, this many people that don't know each other and they aren't connected in any way, they're just homeschoolers, they're all saying the same thing. So there's probably some amount of truth to it and it can help 
avoid some pitfalls along the way and help you have a smoother learning experience with your child. Now, where can you find these uh, homeschool parents? I realize that some of you listening to this, especially if you made it this far in the video, you are probably a new homeschooler and you may not have family who homeschool. You, who, um, you may not have uh, people at your church that homeschool and you may be a pioneer in your area. So where do you meet these people? One of the places that I meet people online is uh, social media groups. Okay. And you can use your search engine and type in maybe uh, your town, your city, your state, and then the word homeschool and see what pops up there. You can also go to your local library. Homeschoolers use the library a lot because they don't necessarily have their own building. That's a good place to ask. And another place to ask is churches in your area. Sometimes homeschoolers will uh, pay a church for the use of their building during the week for one or two days. And there are different groups of homeschoolers that come together. One type of group is called a co-op, and that's just parents coming together, sharing the teaching responsibilities of certain classes. A lot of parents just get together for homes for homeschool co-ops, not necessarily because they feel like they can't teach their child. It's just a chance for them to get together and have support from other parents and me and see them on a weekly basis. Same thing for their children, for the children to make other friends who are homeschoolers. The other kind of group is called a tutorial, and that usually implies that the child is dropped off at a group of homeschoolers. Um, who are divided into classes and have teachers who teach them and can assign, assign some homework with them. Different co-ops meet different times throughout the week. In our area where we live, we have some that meet Monday through Friday, not every day of the week, but we have some that meet once a week on Mondays, others that meet once a week on Tuesdays and so on. And there are even some that meet twice a week. So. A lot of parents make other homeschool friends in these ways. By no means do you have to join a co-op or a tutorial in order to have a successful homeschool year. You can also find some homeschool activities that may be going on in your area, such as different PE groups, maybe different music groups. I know in our area, we'll have um, some places that offer music lessons and they open those up during the week to homeschoolers because most of their clients might be in school during that time. And so it gives them another way that they can earn some money during the day because they can give lessons to homeschool students. I hope that has helped you. If I left anything out, please leave a question in the comment section below. You can also email me, Rebecca at theparentteacherbridge.com. And if you're struggling with your child's reading, you could check out my five quick tips to immediately help your struggling reader. I know a lot of you out there may be considering homeschooling because your child is struggling in an academic area. If that is the case, please reach out to me. I would love to be able to help you. I tutor children on Zoom if uh, they are remote. And I also tutor tutor children uh, locally where I live. And I learned so much through those experiences. It helps me to count my blessings that we are a homeschool family and we can address our children's educational needs in a customized way. Because remember, you are your child's most influential teacher.